let uh, everyone take away. Hi, everyone. So I'll be talking a little bit about the magnitude and trends of neonatal absence syndrome among AIN in the Northwest. And first, uh, the use and misuse of substance during pregnancy is a global public health concern for the off offspring, as well as um, there can be short-term and long-term consequences based on the specific substance being used and exposed, as well as other environmental and um, factors related to the maternal substance dis use disorder. And the significance of substance exposure during pregnancy can have some negative effects as um, fetal development and infant health. And even though we won't be going into details on the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, it is another prenatal substance use that could result in physical developmental problems, including cognitive and functional disability. Prenatal substance exposure could also result in the preterm labor, fetal withdrawal, stillbirth, and neonatal absence syndrome and maternal mortality. In a study that looked at opioid abuse and dependence, it found that opioid abuse and dependence was associated with 4.6 times increased risk of maternal death during hospitalization. And for the duration of this presentation, we'll be focusing um, more on NAS. NAS, when an infant born to a mother with substance use disorder, it is at risk for withdrawal and is commonly referred to as uh, neonatal absence syndrome. It's a postnatal withdrawal syndrome that experienced by some infant, the in utero drug exposed infant. So not all infants exposed would develop an AS. It is often caused when a woman misuses pharmaceutical opioids, either prescribed or not, or other drugs during pregnancy that can include painkillers prescribed following injury or surgery, benzodiazepam commonly prescribed for anxiety, and other illicit drugs such as um, heroin. When the withdrawal is caused by opioid during the 28 days of life, it's often given by another terminology that you sometimes would be um, we hear it's called the neonatal withdrawal um, syndrome for opioids. So that's now. So let's look at some um, some data that we have um, thus far. The many reports already show that the national rates for opioid use disorder are increasing among reproductive age and pregnant women. And um, in the multi-state analysis, which is the graph that you're seeing here on this slide, national prevalence of opioid use disorder increased 330, over 300% 300 from 1999 all the way to 2014. And this is parallel to an overall 300% increase in the sales of prescription painkiller in a general population as reported by the CDC. And this next um, figure from the study shows that a map showing the prevalence of opioid use disorder per thousand delivery hospitalization in the 28 uh, US states during the 2013 and 14 periods. There's an increase in maternal substance misuse. This had led to the increase in NAS birth. And let's look at some of the data that we have in the, in the Northwest. Using Oregon Hospital Discharge data corrected for AIN, we found that an average of nine AIN, as you see in the yellow bar, newborns were diagnosed with NAS for um, every thousand hospital birth. And that is 1.6 times higher than the non-Hispanic white um, newborns during this time. So we'll be looking at um, the trends. So as shown in this um, figure, you see we have data from 2010 all the way to 2017. And this is also from the Oregon Hospital um, inpatient data that has been corrected um, for AIA and racial misclassification. And we see that the rate of NS among newborn having for AIN has increased 
um, from 6.7 all the way on the left and 217 per thousand live birth. And that is an over 150% increase in the span of seven years. This is the Oregon data that we have. And the next one, we'll be looking at the Washington. So the data is from the Washington Hospital Discharge data. And this has also been corrected by um, for the AI and racial misclassification. So we see that the rate of um, NAS among AI and newborn went from 37.8 to 50, over 58 in 2016. That is a 54% increase. And the risk of being diagnosed with NAS for AIM was 3.9 times than that of non-Hispanic white. And this is, um, what you see here is also parallel to the other multi-state study showing that in Washington, the NAS rate was um, the opioid use disorder found among newborns was higher um, than that in Oregon. So we'll be looking at some of the, just the signs of withdrawal. So usually the signs of withdrawal um, will begin within 72 hours after birth, but the onset um, of withdrawal symptoms differ by the prenatal drug exposure. And the impact could be um, categorized into three different systems. As you see on the slide, the central nervous system, the gastrointestinal, and the automatic activation. And any include any of the following symptoms, ranging from trembling, sleep problems, seizure, and poor feedings. Some of the protocol for management based on scoring may differ by institution, but um, studies suggest starting scoring within 24 hours and monitor every three hours. And if there's um, two consecutive scoring for more than 12 or three consecutive scoring for more than eight, then initiate the pharmacological treatment. So um, on the slide, you also see that um, there's assessment and there's also non-pharmacological intervention as well as pharmacological treatment. So for the non-pharmacological intervention, that include comforting measures, environmental control, and maternal support. And a lot of the literature right now has been um, documenting the benefits of treatment during um, pregnancy when a, when a pregnant woman is using substance. Pharmacotherapy, such as um, opioid agonists like the methadone or buprenorphine can improve health outcomes for both and the infant outcomes. And in the literature, it has been shown that buprenorphine is increasingly being used because it's seen that the neonatal withdrawal symptom is less severe when and it's being used. And um, so on the slide, you see that there are some benefits of um, having the pregnant woman receiving treatment, including the risk of newborn re redu reduction in the risk of um, newborn drug withdrawal, uh, decreased rehospitalization, and also reduced risk of overdose death. And some benefits also include uh, increased newborn weights, chance to go to term, and breastfeeding. And this is uh, a slide that I've um, kind of gathered some of the literature showing right now some of the still the barriers and challenging um, associated with accessing to treatment. So to begin with, uh, stigma and um, related to pregnant women with substance use is still very pronounced. One study actually found that um, pregnant women, they have a harder time accessing opioid treatment than non-pregnant women. At the same time, the study also showed that fewer patients with Medicaid were accepted for appointments than though with the um, private insurance. And for all the study that I um, mentioned during the presentation, the citation is always on, um, at the bottom of the slide. And um, another recommendation lesson learned I wanna bring up is um, there were listening session from five tribes in Minnesota. They share what inhibit native women with substance use disorder accessing treatment. The number one factor that came up during the listening session was that fear was a primary factor that inhibit native pregnant women from accessing prenatal care and from seeking treatment for the substance use disorder. The fear included having their newborn as well as um, if they have any older children taken from the home, 
fear of the legal consequences, including incarceration, and the fear stemming from the stigmatization associated with substance use. And um, the, the tribes also share that for the families already involved in social services um, before the baby is born, they are quote unquote educated that services are voluntary and therefore savvy about avoiding engagement in the front end services so they can um, um, avoid any um, scrutiny that they perceive might happen if they do engage in the services. And these make it very difficult to intervene during the pregnancy due to the fear, stigma, and um, shame that impedes a pregnant woman in need of um, from obtaining um, those treatment. And the second one that came up during those um, listening session was the lack of trust. And um, the tribe shared that um, finding non-judgmental physician or care provider um, is a critical factor. And the third is uh, the patient provider. Um, they share that they need education about what's involved in treatments and how to go about uh, uh, obtaining the treatment. And um, the other one also mentioned were the transportation and childcare needs. And I wanted to also talk about um, some of the um, intersection between opioid epidemic, maternal um, health crisis um, during COVID. And I found some of the um, literature emerging saying that not surprising during COVID, pregnant women with substance use disorder may have interrupted treatment because um, the closure of the treatment clinics, social distancing, shelter in space, but also how the, um, the social distancing may affect the mental health of the, um, the pregnant woman. And it could also um, have an effect on the bystander overdose rescue and the threats to income and other um, hardships during this time. And um, this is a time that multiple social risks um, could actually impact the pregnant woman more severely. And um, there has also been reported spike of uh, drug overdose related ED visits during COVID. And that may lead to uh, rising rates of NAS. Um, and um, as uh, Dr. MP had uh, shared and um, our expert panel has shared some of the potential of the telehealth. And I also found a study that talked about the use of um, telehealth during this time. This is a retrospective case study, and the citation is also here, that look at uh, electronic health records, um, found that patient um, with, um, in response to the COVID, they say that um, they shift the model um, to telemedicine, and because the study was done in Massachusetts, um, the state had issued guidance on permitting clinician to initiate prescription via telemedicine and rather than by in-person. And the study showed that um, that enabled buprenorphine prescription to be easily incorporated into their hybrid prenatal care model and for pregnant patients, as well as expansion of the um, take-home protocols. This is something that um, will be uh, looking out for more studies and um, as um, pregnant and postpartum women with SUD, including the opioid use disorder, may experience barriers to care um, even before the pandemic. And um, COVID um, would likely to exacerbate these barriers. So those are some other concerns and possible um, promising uh, shift to the telemedicine that's being found in the literature. So next, I wanted to um, also include some of the information um, found on the benefits of creating integrated care for pregnant women with substance use disorder. Although breastfeeding is typically low among mother with opioid use disorder, the study has found that um, breastfeeding for women, um, for mother in recovery can actually reduce the length of hospital stay and need for morphine treatment in infants. And um, the, it's also being noted that unless there's a specific medical concern such as the maternal HIV infection, it is um, beneficial to encourage mother to breastfeed and swaddle new, newborns as they 
those may ease the symptoms and improve the um, mother and infant bonding. Another thing that had been brought up um, recently is the rooming in. That is an engagement and uh, arrangement in the hospital where the newborn is kept in a crib near the mother bedside instead of in a nursery. And this has also been shown in the literature to decrease length of hospital stay and reduction in the need for pharmacological treatment for the newborn. And some other support um, needed to be considered is um, the tele-treatment program for the, uh, the substance use disorder of the mom. And um, following the previous um, comment um, would be the anti-sigma and trauma-informed care, and also taking into consideration of the social barrier and accessing care, that is um, the food insecurity housing. As one of the tribal um, program manager noted that it is hard to focus on treatment when there's no roof over your head. And um, other, um, other factors to take into consideration, violence, and some possible other psychosocial interventions that um, such as counseling and patient education and um, even patient support are beneficial for mother receiving their treatment. I'll be um, summarizing some key consideration drawing from the literature and the studied um, thus far. On, on the top of this um, slide, you'll see a five-point family intervention diagram. It shows that the work to improve infant health begins before birth, and the ben benefits can carry beyond neonatal childhood and, um, and beyond. Pregnancy is um, often a hopeful time for people with um, substance use disorder, but the sleepiness, anxiety, and intensity of postpartum period may bring increased risk of relapse, so another consideration for um, intervening and um, having more uh, resources and services uh, to bridge that gap. And uh, one of the listening sessions, the tribal program manager also emphasized that cultural is fundamental to healing and recovering for Native Americans. Culturally centered programs are needed before, during, and um, after pregnancy. We need programs that can sensitively and creatively address the issue to improve the delivery of care beyond birth or hospital discharge. And the integrated prenatal and substance use treatment could bring, could bring sustained solution for the mothers and neonates. And um, I also wanted to um, just add that because perinatal substance misuse, it's a complex and multifaceted problem that needs multidisciplinary cross-specialty approach. So um, any of the uh, resources uh, polling usually coming from different disciplines. And I also wanted to share a list of related resources here um, that, that might be helpful in creating a plan uh, for uh, safe care. And um, there's a list of different ones and um, some other resources are also listed on the um, MCH ECHO website. And I also want to acknowledge my colleagues for assisting this presentation and I welcome um, any questions. Thank you. I just want to say that was a great presentation. I really appreciated it. Uh, an emphasis on uh, cultural, culturally appropriate um, counseling and care uh, for the mother and baby. I think that's just so important. Um, you know, and, you know, besides just the neonatal abstinence um, syndrome, you know, having those adverse effects on the baby, you know, to be thinking about prevention um, with the mom, because we all know that, that uh, all the illegal maternal uh, drug use have far lasting impacts on that unborn baby, um, including the brain and neurodevelopment. So, just keeping all that in mind and, and um, you know, working with the families, you know, with uh, the cultural relevance is so important. And just want to thank you again, Chao Wen. It was a great presentation. I agree. And I was so glad you brought up um, that study that had to do with the five tribes in Minnesota. I, I think I'm uh, I think that's where it was. Um, but one of the main reasons that they did not go and receive care was fear. 
Um, and that really brings um, up how we really need to advocate um, for our pregnant women um, at the uh, state and federal level um, about the criminalization of that when they are, are uh, getting treatment, going to get treatment. Okay, if we have no other questions, uh, we just wanted to um, thank our, our uh, visiting faculty, uh, Dr. Uh, Saliva, that really added a lot to our presentation and for Teresa Grun to be able to bring this case forward. And as always, uh, Dr. Empey and uh, Don Bankson for being able to uh, be our faculty for this. And Chow Wen for that wonderful presentation, our very own Northwest Tribal Epidemiology Center um, epidemiologist.